Um, so just quickly about me. So I'm an associate professor in emergency care and I'm based at UE Bristol. Um, I'm part of REACH, which is the Research in Emergency Care um, Avon Collaborative Hub. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about REACH if anyone is, is interested in learning a bit more about what we do. Um, I've got a bit of an odd background. So I work in emergency care now um, in, in research. Um, but previously I worked in maternity research, which is where I've kind of aligned um, these two interests into kind of pre-hospital birth, so the emergency side of maternity. Um, my PhD was in midwifery, um, but I'm not, I, I don't work clinically, I'm not a clinician, um, I'm purely research, so hopefully no no hard questions at the end. I'll try, try my best to answer any clinical questions, but um, just putting that out there. So as I said, I'm, I'm kind of interested in pre-hospital birth as it's aligning my emergency care work with my maternity background, and I'm going to focus specifically on um, neonatal hypothermia. So um, just a quick overview of kind of what I'm going to talk about. So um, I'm going to start with some overviews of um, recent research findings. So these are projects that I've I've led in the last few years. So the first one is ambulance service data. Um, the second one is around hospital data um, and also 999 call handler advice. Um, and then I'm going to look at some kind of um, the impact of the work that we've been doing and look at some kind of practical tips. Um, so we'll end with some kind of research opportunities in case it's interesting for anyone, but that's the kind of overview of, of what I'll go through today. Um, so just a, a quick background. Um, in the UK, there are around 4,000 uh, pre-hospital births, sometimes known as birth before arrival or BBA um, a year. So th this is actually an estimate. So there's no actual um, national data on pre-hospital births. So you have to kind of, um, either estimate from um, st statistics or kind of count up and go to individual trusts and kind of ask them how many they're having and kind of count it up. But I know locally in SWAST, the Southwest Ambulance Service, we have about 550 a year. Um, so I, I think 4,000 might even be an underestimate. Um, so pre-hospital birth or BBA um, is associated with poorer outcomes for babies. Um, there's also been some literature around kind of who is who is more at risk of having a, a BBA um, or pre-hospital birth. And um, there's some evidence to suggest that depending on your ethnic group, um, socioeconomic status um, and your kind of engagement with antenatal care, you may be um, more or less at risk. Um, hypothermia is one of the biggest risk factors for babies born in the pre-hospital setting. Um, and so the, the way in which that kind of uh, results in poor outcomes is by creating cold stress to the baby. Um, so to warm up, they increase their metabolic rate and oxygen consumption. Um, and then that can lead to hypoxia, uh, hypoxia, neurologic damage and hypoglycemia. So that's in especially important for um, premature or low birth weight infants. So for every one degree um, that a baby comes into hospital um, below that 36.5, so 36.5 is the um, WHO classification for hypothermia. So for every degree that they come into hospital below that, their relative risk of death increases by at least 28%. Um, and for each minute that they're exposed, their, their temperature can drop by a third of a degree. So you can imagine, you know, if it's um, uh, outside, they're born outside or in a house that's not been kind of sufficiently warmed, then within five minutes, they could potentially become hypothermic and that relative risk of death could, could have increased already by 28%. Um, temperature management is challenging. Um, it's challenging in hospital. So even when babies are being transferred kind of between delivery suite and uh, postnatal ward, um, keeping temperatures up can, can be challenging then. And it's especially challenging in the pre-hospital setting. Um, but it is the only risk factor uh, that can be influenced in the pre-hospital setting. So other kind of risk factors for um, that are specific to pre-hospital birth are kind of things like gestation and birth weight, which obviously you can't impact on once the baby's born, but temperature is something that can be influenced in the pre-hospital setting. And the quicker that temperature's uh, managed, obviously we can um, reduce the risk of hyper hypothermia. So I'm sure uh, lots of you, I've seen lots of you are here are paramedics and student paramedics um, from the UK. So we've got JR Calc guidance, um, and their kind of section on care of the newborn outlines the risk of hypothermia for pre-hospital birth and recommends temperature assessment. Um, but it's not very clear or it hasn't been previously very clear on kind of what that 
means so kind of how that temperature should be how that temperature should be taken when it should be taken if it should be repeated and how you should kind of act on that um there's been some research previously which suggests that temperatures aren't taken routinely in the pre-hospital setting so um don't know if any of you know Graham McClelland um so uh, he led some work in the Northeast Ambulance Service looking at um observations neonatal observations and found that um, around 10% of babies had um, a temperature recorded um, in in those in in the um, notes of their uh, yeah their patient records. Um, there was also some work done in Australia, which found similarly quite low rates of temperature recording um, in the pre-hospital setting. So it was quite important to understand the challenges to recording temperatures. So obviously it's very important for babies. So obviously if a temperature is not uh, taken or recorded, then potentially that baby could be hypothermic um, and no one's realized. And so there are obviously the increased risk of poor outcomes. Um, but it's also um, important for paramedics or other EMS staff um, because we found a couple of cases in the Southwest where babies had come into hospital cold from the ambulance service. Um, some some with kind of unrecordable temperatures um, and unfortunately died or had quite poor outcomes and when they kind of looked back at the patient care records there was no documentation that paramedics um, or ambulance staff had taken a temperature um, or that they'd kind of used any warming measures so it was really difficult then to kind of to show um, the steps that had been taken to try and warm that baby up. Um, it's also quite important to understand the challenges because as we saw there are some kind of inequalities in potentially who's at risk of having these births. Um, so we are potentially kind of disadvantaging those people even more if, if temperatures aren't being kind of recorded and acted upon. So um, this is the first project that we, we did um, looking at ambulance service data. So this is, I got a bit of funding from UE to look into um, the situation in the Southwest to see maybe we're doing it brilliantly in the Southwest, maybe even Northeast are terrible at taking temperatures and we're brilliant. So that was what we wanted to find out. Um, so we looked at anonymized care records over a three year period in SWAST. Um, and as I said, we had around 550 of these pre hospital births a year, and only 2.7% had neonatal temperature recorded. So um, NAS were, were winning, they were 10%. So it was even lower than we kind of um, expected or hoped. Um, when a temperature was recorded, a neonatal temperature was recorded, 72% of them were hypothermic. Um, interestingly as well, only 70% 70, um, 70 had just one measurement recorded. So even if that first measurement was hypothermic, often um, another temperature wasn't repeated. Um, so yeah, a lot of the time it was just that one kind of measurement documented and then we, we just couldn't tell what had, what had happened after that. Um, I don't know if there are any Bristol paramedics here today, but that is um, that picture there is my cousin Kate. She's a paramedic based in um, central Bristol, and I got her to model for some of these photos, so you might spot some familiar faces. Um, just in the corner there as well, there's the paper that kind of summarises um, these findings and has a little bit more detail if anyone is interested in, in finding out a bit more about what we did and how. Um, as part of that work, we, we also wanted to find out kind of um, what the challenges were to taking temperatures. So obviously, it's quite a low proportion of um, temperatures being taken, and it is supposed to be a routine assessment as part of JR Calc. So we really wanted to understand kind of what was happening and why those weren't um, being done. So we did interviews with 20 operational paramedics in SWAST, um, and there were these kind of barriers that came out from those interviews. So... Um, I'm sure these are not um, unfamiliar to you. The The first one was equipment. Um, so a lot of the paramedics were saying, well, we are supposed to be using the axilla thermometer. So that's kind of nice guidance is that you use an axilla thermometer um, for newborn temperatures. Um, but actually they only had, a lot of the time, they only had um, the digital thermometers and which couldn't be used on newborns. They weren't suitable for newborns, um, the tympanics. So um, actually, the auxillas, what ended up happening was because they were used so infrequently because it wasn't a job that they went to a lot of the time. The batteries would die, especially being on a kind of cold, cold vehicle all the time. Um, and then they'd just get thrown away and not replaced. So a lot of the time when they found that they actually went to try and take a temperature, they didn't have the right equipment. 
The second barrier was kind of the prioritisation of care. So I think um, speaking to paramedics, birth is kind of one of those ones that they really dread going to because it um, of the fear of, of things kind of going wrong, um, also having two patients to deal with. Um, and actually, most people were kind of focused on, OK, is the baby out? Are they breathing? Um, is mum bleeding? Is everything kind of OK? And and if everything kind of was, then they kind of left things alone, took a step back, you know, dried the baby, wrapped them, gave them to mum and then took a step back. So actually they knew that it was really important to keep the baby warm. Um, but actually taking a temperature, measuring that temperature wasn't seen um, as a priority. They were kind of um, had other things going on that they, they thought would take priority over that. The next one was the care pathway for cold babies. So there was some kind of questions around, well, actually, you know, I'm doing everything I can already to keep that baby warm. What more would I do if I knew that they were hypothermic? How would that help me? Um, you know, what should I be taking them in for hypothermia? What What's the next step? So again, that was kind of a barrier because they didn't really see much value in taking a temperature. But as we kind of the conversation went on, um, they kind of said, oh, well, actually, yeah, there probably are other things that I could do or try if I did know if I knew that that baby was hypothermic or maybe I would consider taking them in. Um, and then the design of the patient care record um, in SWAST. So they've got an electronic patient care record. Um, so there's the maternal tab, which has APGAR and things like that on, but there's no specific box for temperature for the, ne uh, for the neonate on there. Um, so to get a, a box for neonatal temperature, you have to create a new neonatal record. Um, so a lot of paramedics weren't doing that because they were saying, well, the baby hasn't got a name or an NHS number yet. So unless they need kind of resuscitation or any intensive intervention, actually, most of the time, I just write everything in the free text the maternal record so again not having that kind of prompt of a specific box for temperature um, meant that they they just didn't see it as a priority so we kind of knew what was happening in the pre-hospital setting what we didn't know was kind of how that was impacting on the um, hospital settings so what was happening when those babies got to hospital and um, so we managed to get some funding from health innovation southwest so they used to be called the um AHSN, Academic Health Science Network, they've all changed to become health innovations now. Um, so we got some funding from them to look at our local hospital data. Um, so we had um, six hospital trusts in the southwest. And again, it was over a three year period. So we found 216 babies that were brought into those trusts or into those hospitals by the ambulance service and found that 35 percent of these babies were hypothermic on arrival. Um, and 25% of those were moderately or severely hypothermic, um, as, as you can see from the WHO classification. So obviously, 35% is a lot better than the 72% that, um, that seemed to be hypothermic in the pre-hospital setting. So I think what was happening was, you know, paramedics were taking temperatures of babies that they thought might be cold. And so that made it look like, you know, a higher majority of, of the babies were cold. Um, but obviously, 35 percent, there's still a lot of room for improvement on that um, in terms of the number of babies coming in hypothermic. So we we kind of had a little bit of data about the number of babies coming in hypothermic. But what we didn't know was what, or what we were really interested in was um, this kind of inequalities angle. So um, you're, you're probably aware there are. Um, ethnic and migrant inequalities in maternal and perinatal outcomes in the UK. So this, these are these are statistics taken from Embrace UK reports. I think they're probably newer ones than this now. Um, but for example, black women in the UK um, have a four times higher risk of dying in pregnancy um, in the UK. Um, and then there's also inequalities based on kind of deprivation um, and there's perinatal inequalities as well. So higher risks of stillbirth and things like that. So we thought, OK, well, there are inequalities in risk um, of having a pre-hospital birth as well. And there are inequalities anyway in outcomes. If we can kind of reduce the risk of poor outcome following a pre-hospital birth, can we go some way to address um, these inequalities? So that was really kind of what we were thinking with our um, next piece of work. Um, so these are correlations. Um, so they're and it's small numbers. So we looked at those births um, we looked at those babies that had been brought in by the ambulance service 
Um, and we compared that to data from the national maternity data set. So we looked at Southwest data in general on births. And then we compared that to um, the pre-hospital births coming in from the ambulance service. And we found that um, there may be some women who are more likely to have a pre-hospital birth in the Southwest. Um, and those are um, women who report safeguarding concerns at their booking appointment. Um, those that book later in their pregnancy, so um, past 13 weeks. Um, and those that have had babies before. So they may be more likely to have a pre-hospital birth based on our data. Um, out of those pre-hospital births, um, we found some babies that were more likely to be hypothermic on arrival. So preterm babies, which probably isn't a surprise to anyone. Um, so they were much more likely to be hypothermic on arrival at hospital. Um, again, say if the mother had reported safeguarding concerns or a disability at their booking appointment, they tended to be more likely to be hypothermic um, and if it was the first a first baby. And again, that that might kind of make sense if you don't have experience with babies or children, then potentially they, they might be more likely to be hypothermic. Um, we really wanted to look at kind of ethnicity and deprivation because we knew that those were potential risk factors. Um, unfortunately, as is the world of research, it doesn't always go to plan. Um, and if anyone actually has any ideas on this, then I would be really happy to hear them, <laughs> would be excited to hear them. Um, so we found a, a really interesting problem, which I don't know if anyone else has come across. Um, but our, the data set that we had for these pre-hospital births, um, we took ethnicity data from the booking notes. And they were um, the way that ethnicity was classified, uh, maternal ethnicity was classified was um, in terms of kind of British, European, Middle East and South African um, but when we looked at the national maternity data set, it was classified in a completely different way. So it was white, black or black British, Asian or Asian British. And obviously they just don't, you can't fit those together. You can't say, um, OK, is someone who's British European white or black? You, it doesn't, they don't fit. So we couldn't actually make any comparisons um, on ethnicity from our data to the um, national maternity data set. And so I don't know where the national maternity data set gets ethnicity data if it's not from the booking notes so if anyone has any ideas on that that'd be brilliant so we're still trying to kind of unpick that um in terms of deprivation um we only got the first part of the postcode from hospital trusts so we couldn't actually look at deprivation because um we needed more of the postcode to work out kind of a lower layer super output area and deprivation scores and things like that so again we're kind of going to go back and see if there's anything else that we can do in that area um, we looked at the outcomes um, of the babies that were brought in, brought in by the ambulance service um, and found that um, seven of the hypothermic babies had an extended length of stay in hospital, so more than seven days, whereas none of the warm babies did, so none of the normal thermic babies did. But obviously, again, um, that's a difficult one to unpick because, again, preterm babies were more likely to be hypothermic so and they would normally have a longer length, they would have yeah, a longer length of stay anyway. So again, these are just kind of correlations. Um, again, more treatment was given to hypothermic babies, so that makes sense. They had more glu glucose, radiant heat source and incubator. Um, but skin to skin was practiced similarly between the two groups, so hypothermic and, and normal thermic babies. So we kind of looked at, OK, what's happening in the pre-hospital setting in terms of um, paramedics or ambulance staff? We looked at, OK, what happens in the hospital setting when they get to hospital? But there was still a kind of bit of the jigsaw missing, which is what happens before the ambulance gets there. So obviously people um, call 999 about um, labour or imminent birth. Um, and that's potentially um, a gap where paramedics haven't arrived on scene yet. And the baby could potentially already be born or be born while the person's on the phone to um ambulance service and they could potentially be already hypothermic then by the time the paramedic gets there and then the the ambulance staff have a really difficult uh, job to then warm the baby back up so obviously the earlier we can intervene with that the lower the risk of that, that baby coming in hypothermic so what we wanted to do was look at okay what advice is being given to people when they call 999 about a pre-hospital birth um so most of you, but I guess not all of you, if you're working um, in, in different countries. 
So we'll know in the UK, there are two different kind of triage systems, two different EMS systems for um, calls. Uh, so you've got AMPDS, which is an American system, um, which is used in around half of the trusts in the UK. And then you've got NHS Pathways, which is the other system, which is used roughly in the other half. Um, so what we did is we looked at calls from both systems. So we got calls from SWAS, who used AMPDS, and NAS, who use NHS Pathways. Um, and we got 30 recordings of those calls. Um, and we made sure that they were from kind of different areas, so different um, areas of deprivation to kind of make it a bit more diverse. Um, and we analysed those. So the first step was to look at kind of the advice that was actually being given. So um, we kind of made them into flow charts. So we're looking at like the actual wording of, of the advice um, and how people were kind of talking um, talking to the person on the phone. And then we took that to focus groups with NHS staff. So big kind of meetings with NHS staff. So we had 18 participants across four focus groups and it was a mix of professions. So we had paramedics, ACPs, midwives, school handlers, LDOs um, and neonatal staff. Um, so each of those kind of focus groups had a mix of staff all together. So it wasn't like one group was midwives, one group was paramedics. We had kind of everyone um, discussing this together. Um, so we looked at, we kind of started those discussions with, OK, what's best practice if if someone called you about um, a pre-hospital birth? Um, what advice would you give around temperature management? So what, you know, when would that happen? What kind of things would you be telling people? And then we compared that to the advice that's given both in AMPDS and NHS pathways. And we looked at whether there were any kind of gaps, um, anything missing, anything that could be improved upon. Um, and then we did an analysis of that. Um, from that, we um, then took all of that information to some focus groups with patients and the public. So these are people who'd either experienced a pre-hospital birth or had experience of not calling 999 about a pre-hospital birth. Um, and we kind of took the, the findings from the two steps. So we looked at, OK, this is the advice that's currently being given at the moment. Um, this is what the NHS staff said about it. So this is how they feel about that advice. Um, and you know potential changes to that and then we asked them did they feel that uh, you know how do they feel about the changes suggested how do they feel about the advice that's been given um but also kind of focusing on practical aspects so is the advice practical is it easy to follow is it accessible to everyone um is it kind of easy for everyone to understand um and then we did a thematic analysis of that as well so from, from all of that work, we found five main themes that were identified as impacting on neonatal temperature management during 999 calls. These are kind of potential barriers um, to normothermia, basically. Um, so the first one was the importance placed on neonatal temperature. So during the calls, both in AMPDS and in NHS pathways, um, the, the caller was told to keep mum and baby warm. Um, but they weren't really told, you know, how important that was. It was just kind of given in a list of other instructions. So when we spoke with um, people who had experienced pre-hospital birth, a lot of them were saying, oh, you know, I had no idea that it was, you know, that it was so important. Um, once I'd had the baby, attention kind of shifted to me and whether I was bleeding. They felt that, you know, the call handler's attention, once the baby was kind of established as being as breathing, um, you know, there was little kind of attention paid to them. And actually, a few of them said, actually, when we got to hospital, we were kind of almost, you, you know, we were, we were told that the baby was cold and asked if we'd kind of done anything about it. And we, and we hadn't, we just hadn't realised that it was it was that important. So that was the kind of main thing. Uh, the first thing that came out was just that actually it needs to be emphasised how important it is to keep the baby warm. The, the second theme that came out was... Um, advice on where the baby should be placed following birth. Now, placed probably isn't quite the right word, but I can think of anything better. So this is about kind of what, as, as soon as the baby's born, um, what happens with it, basically. So um, in AMPDS, what we found was that the advice was to um, put the baby between the mother's legs. Um, if you go kind of further back in the algorithm or the, the pathway, um, the first, one of the first kind of instructions is to lie 
uh, the beat, the, the woman on her back in the middle of um, a bed or the floor. And listening to these calls, a lot of the time, people would be kind of in the bathroom or in the kitchen um, and that you'd end up with this baby kind of being born onto a cold kind of kitchen or bathroom floor and then being placed between the, um, the woman's legs um, and then being told to kind of keep them there until the paramedics arrived. And, and you know, obviously that ended up in hypothermia a few times because um, the baby was kind of there exposed um, on a cold floor. So that, again, was kind of identified as something that could potentially be causing issues. With NHS Pathways, the advice was to put the baby onto the uh, mum's chest or tummy. And at first, when we were discussing this, I was like, oh, brilliant, skin to skin. Um, but actually, when we thought about it a bit more, it was, we realised actually there was no instruction, you know, for the mother to remove any clothing. Um, and in these kind of pre-hospital births, I'm sure if you've been to them, you know, often um, it happens. It's, it's because it's happened so quickly and um, often the woman hasn't kind of removed layers of clothing or anything. So they potentially just putting the baby onto kind of clothing, which isn't getting that benefit of skin to skin. So that was a real kind of topic of conversation. Um, and, you know, whether we should be promoting skin to skin, obviously it's hard in the non-visual environment, not being able to see kind of airway and things like that, um, and concerns over the cord breaking. But I think what came out of it was that if possible, skin to skin was the best thing to do um and also for members of the public they felt that that was what was most natural you know they'd gone through their antenatal journey learning about skin to skin and how important it was um so actually being told to put the baby down kind of between their legs felt very unnatural to them so they would they kind of said that that was something they they, they felt would uh, they'd appreciate as a change um the next part was kind of about specific advice on how to keep the baby warm. So again, as I mentioned, um, a few times they were told, oh, um, keep mum and baby warm, but they weren't told specifically how to do that. So um, a lot of the people who'd experienced pre-hospital um, pre birth were saying, oh, you know, it was such a panic. Um, I kind of lost all common sense. We had one midwife, one participant who was actually a midwife herself, but who'd had a pre-hospital birth. Um, and she was saying, you know, I'm a midwife, but even I forgot about keeping my baby warm. I just, you know, had the baby and kind of was just staring at it there on the bed, not really <laughs> knowing what to do. It was just kind of panic. And so actually um, it, they felt it was really important to be given specific advice on how they could keep their baby warm. So, um, for example, environmental things like if you can put the heating on. Um, if you've got a hat or something, pop, pop it on, make sure that all the towels are dry, um, close any windows or doors, that kind of thing. Um, so that, again, was really important to them. Um, the next thing was around the timing of temperature management advice. So um, there were quite a few gaps in the conversation. So while, while the woman was um, labouring um, or while she was waiting for the par paramedics to arrive, um, actually there could be quite long gaps in the conversation and um, the call handlers were using that to kind of make small talk so oh is this your first baby um, have you got any names that kind of thing um, whereas actually that could really be used to talk about um, uh, talk about temperature you know checking in it, can you feel is the baby does the baby feel warm or cold um, have you managed to find any um, hats or things like that and then the, the last point was around the clarity and the priority of instructions. So found that there was actually some kind of confusing instructions in there. So, for example, um, in NHS Pathways, they were told to peel or wipe away the sack just after the baby was born. And um, as you'll probably know, it's quite rare for babies to be born in the sack. So um, you had a lot of usually it was the kind of the dad um, calling in and was very confused about what the sack was. Um, and actually that instruction really delayed the warming um, instructions. So potentially that baby was kind of just exposed while, while they were trying to um, explain what the sack was and why they were giving that instruction. So from that, there were um, a few suggested changes to call handler advice. So um, highlighting the importance of neonatal temperature, encouraging skin to skin contact and removing any advice that ends in babies on the floor or the bed. Um, offering specific warming measures, so ideas for what people could do to keep the baby warm, um, using gaps in the conversation to promote warming um, and check whether advice has been followed, 
and then just making sure that the advice given is kind of consistent with the, pro the priority of the actions that need to be taken. So uh, just looking at local impact, so SWAS, Southwestern Ambulance Service, um, just kind of took this and run, ran, which was amazing. So they did an audit of their auxiliary thermometers on their frontline vehicles um, and restocked them. They found that, yeah, a lot of their frontline vehicles didn't have any or maybe had one. Um, so that's that's really um, helped just having the right equipment. Um, they've also made changes to their patient care record to include a new tab um, on care of the newborn. Um, so this has a, a specific box for neonatal temperature management, which is kind of um, the first thing that they're asked to put in. If they put in a um, measurement that is hypothermic, they're kind of prompted, said, to, you know, to consider hypothermia. Um, it's also got a tick box, um, tick boxes for how they manage the temperature. So they'll be asked, have they used um, a trans warmer mattress, which they've got available to them in SWAST? Um, have they put a hat on? Have they encouraged skin to skin? So it's kind of really just reminding them of all the things they can do um, to, to manage hypothermia. Um, they've also made sure that it's really highlighted in their staff development days and um, hypothermia has been um, kind of emphasised in those staff development days. And then they created some um, staff facing posters on neonatal hypothermia. So this is the poster that, um, that they created. So just to remind staff, so this is in their ambulance um, stations. So just to remind staff about hypothermia um, and things that they can do to potentially manage that. Um, in terms of further reaching impact, we've had some national and international impact with this work. So um, I uh, go in and do some guest lectures on the paramedic science, um, uh, the paramedic science program, both at UWE and Hertfordshire as well. So just again, to talk, talk to the student paramedics um, about neonatal hypothermia. Um, the findings have been included in the out of hospital newborn life support course, which um, was probably discussed at the maternity symposium. Um, and it's also the, the suggested changes that I've just run through about call handler advice. So both NHS Pathways and AMBDS have um, made changes based on uh, those findings. So all of the points that we kind of covered have um, have been, have, all of those changes have been made, which is amazing. So NHS Pathways will roll that out in September. I think that change was made in September and um, AMPDS were kind of working on the exact wording for those changes at the moment, but that's kind of imminent. So that's brilliant as well. Um, there's been some work kind of going on in other places um, to, to do with this work. So some kind of parallel work. So I know the, um, maternity leads um, for the ambulance services, they've been kind of promoting trans warmers, trying to get trans warmers into the UK trusts um, or new thermometers, so auxiliary thermometers or similar. Um, Norfolk, um, their maternity and neonatal system, they've introduced a thermoregulation leaflet. So this is actually given antenatally to women at 32 weeks and just tells them about the importance of thermoregulation because they found they were having babies coming in cold as well. So they've actually kind of kind of targeted antenatally as well. And then they've got staff facing posters um, and development days in hospital as well, just to remind um, hospital staff about, ne uh, about neonatal hypothermia. Um, and then the Welsh Ambulance Service. So I know Bethan's here, so that's brilliant. So they've done some really similar work. So um, Bethan Jones and Steve McGee from the Welsh Ambulance Service, um, they had some audit data and they found that similarly to SWAST, around 3% of babies had a temperature taken and recorded in the pre-hospital setting and they've made a load of changes as well. So they've now got mandatory training on thermoregulation for all of their patient facing clinical staff. Um, they've got newborn mannequins now to ensure kind of education of um, thermoregulation is, is kind of a key part of their NLS training. Um, they've purchased these near help um, heat prevention, uh, heat loss prevention suits um, and auxiliary thermometers. So again, we've got trans warmer mattresses and SWAST, but I know different trusts use different things. Um, and then they've got some um, specific pre-hospital or out of, out of hospital newborn life support multidisciplinary training. Um, and then also they're kind of collecting this data as well to look at impacts. So they've got some baseline data about staff's um, feelings on monitoring and main maintaining pre-hospital um, normothermia. And then they're kind of going to uh, repeat that and see if things have improved and how they're looking over time. Um, and I know me and um, Bethan had a chat a few weeks back 
um, where they had a case of um, 28 week twins who came in um, from the pre-hospital setting, I think it's like three degrees or something outside. Um, and their temperatures were pretty much normothermic. Well, one of them was just under and the other one was, was well, um, was yeah, normothermic, which is just amazing to be in those kind of temperatures um, for, for premature twins. Um, and I think uh, the last I heard from Beth and they're doing really well. So that's just amazing shows that um, this kind of promotion can have a really positive impact. So in terms of further impact, we've um, made changes to the call handler advice already. Um, so that was the first aim was kind of to improve that advice around temperature man management. Um, we're hoping that that will help to reduce the number of babies that arrive at hospital hypothermic. Um, we're hoping to get some funding to actually evaluate that to see whether that has happened or not. Um, if we can reduce the number of babies arriving at hospital hypothermic, we can hopefully improve neonatal outcomes. Um, and if we can improve neonatal outcomes for those babies, as we saw, there are inequalities um, in who's at risk of having those kind of births. So we're hoping that we might be able to uh, kind of in some way address those inequalities by disproportionately benefiting um, people who are more at risk. Um, so just some kind of practical tips um, for attending if you're going to these pre-hospital births. Um, just very simply making sure that you're measuring and recording a temperature. So if you don't have if you don't have the right equipment, um, first of all, you know, if they are parents themselves or if they were expecting to have a baby, they may have an auxiliary thermometer themselves. So asking um, if they have one is absolutely fine. Take a temperature. If the, if you don't have the if you don't have um, a, a thermometer, even just kind of using your hand on the um, chest or the back of the neck and just seeing if they feel warm or cold to the touch. Um, if you can, repeating measurements, if you're staying kind of on scene, repeating them at least every hour or when changing environments. So if you've gone onto the ambulance, um, checking again kind of when you're there. Um, recording what measures, warming measures you've used or at least suggested. Because some people, you, they may not want to do skin to skin, that's fine, but still recording that you've kind of encouraged that. So again, um, that's mainly for, you know, if there are problems with hypothermia when you get to hospital, just being able to document, um, you know, what warming measures have been used or suggested. Um, using a trans warmer mattress or similar. So I know um, often the guidance is to use it if you know they're hypothermic. Um, in SWAS, we kind of encourage it, it to be used anyway, if it, especially if it's kind of cold weather. Um, just expecting that you're probably going to need to use it um, to keep that baby warm. Um, getting the environment as warm as possible. So I know it's really hard with ambulances. You know, you're told to put the heating on full, but as soon as you open the doors, all of the heat just goes. Um, but obviously just, yeah, keeping that environment as warm as possible, whether it's the ambulance or whether it's a um, person's home or wherever you are, wherever that baby's being born, um, closing all windows and doors, putting the heating on if possible. Um, Checking if mum's warm. So obviously, if mum is cold, then skin to skin might not be the best idea with with her. Um, you could do skin to skin with um another family member or someone else there. If um, yeah, if if possible, or um, if mum is warm, then yeah, doing skin to skin and encouraging feeding. And then um, if possible, again, kind of warm clothes or a hat. So I know some people have put things on radiators so clothing on radiators before putting them on the baby or towels on radi radiators that kind of thing or in the tumble dryer if they've got one um in terms so that's kind of on attendance some some things that you you can do to kind of um try and promote normothermia in terms of before you actually go to these jobs so checking just checking whether you have thermometers um on your vehicle um, or the, the right equipment. So um, checking the, there is a, a minimum kit list for neonates now. So this was updated by the Recess Council um, last year. Um, and just checking and seeing what your ambulance service um, or, or wherever it is that you're based, what, um, what equipment they have and whether that matches with that minimum kit list and what's kind of optimal for um, helping you um, promote normothermia. So then I've just put a little bit about um, some research opportunities. So um, if you are interested in learning more about kind of our pre-hospital 
or um, emergency care research in general, I've put a QR code for our annual report so that just summarises all the work that we've been doing over the last year, including this piece of work. But we're, it's very varied. We do stuff on end of life care. We do stuff on trauma. We do stuff on cardiac arrest, um, dementia, all kinds of things. So if you are interested in research in general in emergency care, please do have a look at that and, and feel free to get in touch with us. Um, I don't know how many of you are part of the emergency care incubator, the NHR emergency care incubator. But again, that's a good place to kind of start if you're interested in emergency care research, just learning a bit more about what's happening. Um, and then just to highlight um, for anyone who is looking at doing any research, the NIHR have their research for patient benefit programme running at the moment, and they are looking for um, AHP leads. So they this is you can apply for um, up to 500,000 for a three year project. Um, and they are really um, kind of focusing on AHP leads at the moment. So if you are interested in that, they're looking for expressions of interest. Um, by the 26th of um, uh, January, February, March. <laughs> I was trying to work out then. Um, so yeah, 26th of March, um, if you are interested in that. So do kind of um, have a Google of that if, if research is something you're interested in doing.